The Symphony of the Cows. Welcome to the Musicians Map Podcast. I'm Kane. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to say I'm, right. I'm Ruth. Okay, great. Something a little bit different tonight. We're outside um, because it's such a beautiful evening in Raglan, where we currently live. Uh, for those of you tuning in on YouTube, you're not going to see a video of us um, because... Because Ruth didn't want to put makeup on. That's why. And she's still finding her feminist roots. So you're going to see a picture of the sunset that we are currently looking at uh, going down over Mount Karioi. Uh, and you're probably everyone who's listening is going to be hearing the sounds of nature. The sounds of cows in the distance. Namely cows. Yeah, there's, I don't know what's happening over there, but the cows that you can hear are miles away. We're just at the top of a huge, big oh, there valley. You go. Yeah, there's a big one. I think they're I mating. Think there's a mass mating going on. Otherwise, you might hear our snuffly little dogs. Uh, they're around, Amore and Benson. Um, those of you lucky enough to follow us on Instagram will be getting a treat of pictures with those. So welcome to the podcast. Um, everyone, before you listen to this podcast, go and buy the Musician's Map ebook, uh, a wealth of knowledge there. And if you don't want to buy it, um, go and download the free ebook, which um, is much smaller, but still has a great, great wealth of information um, on how... But you should buy how it. To get your, how to get your music heard. You should go buy the book, though, because that's how we can continue to what, make the how podcast. How much does it cost? It costs $9.99. And you call yourself a musician if you can't pay $9 for some valuable advice. It's funny, isn't it? But the only way the podcast can can, 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 can continue to go um, is, is if you buy the book. Please buy the book. <laughs> um, what are we looking at here? I'm, I'm, I'm We're trying to We're looking at about notes. three beers and half, most of a bottle of wine. I should say that I'm just happy to be your fill-in guest, you know. Hey, this isn't a fill-in. You're a feature. <laughs> you know, it's been a big week for me, so I'm just kicking it back with a few wines and Kane says, let's have a discussion. So I'm joined by Ruth Power, my wife. Uh, she is from Piano Picnic. And this week, Piano Picnic launched Songs by Air, uh, the flagship course. Premiere. Yeah. And... Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that before we kick well, off? Well, Songs by Air, if I may just shoot off the cuff for a moment, is about teaching you the skills you need to be able to sit at a piano and play the songs you love just by listening. No longer do you need to go out and find the sheet music for that particular obscure song that you want to learn. No. You don't need to do that. You don't need to waste the money. You don't need to scour tutorials on YouTube of some half-baked person giving you a half-rate uh, tutorial. No offense to YouTube. But this course gives you the skills to be able to work out a song for yourself. Uh, and that's a valuable skill that you will keep for your lifetime. And you will build on it. And you will become better at it. And it's exciting. It's a thing that most people think is just a gift, but it's not. It's it's teachable. <laughs> and it's hosted on Teachable. Hosted on Teachable.com. Yeah, it is Teachable. I'm not sponsored, by the way. No, this con podcast isn't sponsored at all, hence um, the plugs of our own stuff. Oh, we'll plug until the cows come home. Oh! They are home. They are home. <laughs> Anyway, um, it's been a fantastic day. We have been out on the beach, um, drinking beers, just you know, eating food. It's been it's been killer. But why you're listening uh, is probably for listening? some information about <laughs> about some things to do with making music. Um, how you can become a better musician. What are the secrets? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have those secrets, and we like to share them. And this podcast is about preparing for gigs um something that we have done a ton of times <laughs> we've prepared and we've not prepared we have not prepared um and we've had shitty gigs and we've prepared and had amazing gigs um and this is about doing them the most that you can to get yourself ready to present your music because ultimately this is where most of your fans are going to be one right 
in the live performance mm. arena. Oh, I feel lucky. If you put on a good gig, that's when you win people over. You're in the same room with people. You, you're giving, they're giving you the chance to win them over. They're standing in front of you saying, hey, yeah. you know, I, I, want to, I want to like you. Impress me. And that's your chance to do it. People aren't easy, though. You, you do have to work for it. It's not, it's not just, hey, look at me. I'm a musician. Therefore, you must respect me. Uh, people have already made their part of the effort. They've made their part of the deal coming along to the gig. They pay their entry fee or whatever. Or maybe it's a free gig. But they've done their part by getting out of their house, which is the main battle. Mm. I mean, that's... Getting people to come. Oh that is major. A person left their house and came to a music venue to watch a band. You're already a fucking... Ch- you can Ooh. swear, it's fine. Can I swear? Yeah. Um, you're already a champion, you know. So... But you've got to make it worth their while. You think how many people are in the crowd or how many people have left their comfy-ass couches with Netflix, you know, mm. and, and that's a sacrifice. And they've come out to see your shitty band. Your shitty band play your songs and your entitled yep. sort of I'm a musician attitude. No, you got to put on a show. you got to. you got to. And the first thing that I want to – the first topic I want to broach is rehearsal because <clears throat> um, – Let's be honest, if you're not rehearsed, I don't know, even know what you're doing uh, getting up on the stage unless it's a jam night or something. I don't know. We've always rehearsed. I've always rehearsed. Take pride in what you do. Come on, people. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's two kind of sides of the coin. You, you can rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and be kind of obsessed with perfectionism and, and never feel like you're ready to do a gig. Just you just got to get out there at that point. You know, what I mean, if if you mm. if you've not done a gig with your band, it's a new band. You just got to get out there. You just got to get on the horse or, or whatever the saying is, because you'll see pretty clearly as soon as you do a gig where your weak points are, and so that's great. Just don't invite everyone you know, you know, for the first gig, maybe. Right? Yeah, I guess. Or just or just jump on jump on in the deep end. But yeah, I think you're right about the. Because I've been in bands that have we've rehearsed for six months before we've done a show, and you know, super and you polished can, and crazy. Be, yeah. But you don't. You probably don't even need to be that rehearsed. You well, just you need to be, be able to get through it, really. You can be polished in the rehearsal room, and then you go to a live gig, and it all falls yeah, apart. Yeah, it's entirely different. The sound is different. Everything is different about getting on stage with pressure in front of people. Yeah. The lights, you can't hear each other. Um, yeah, I mean, so. Be rehearsed. Rehearse your songs. But what I'm kind of getting at is um, other other aspects of rehearsing before a gig, like um, figuring out what songs you're going to play and writing a set list. But it's about being prepared and and have, putting putting forward a kind There's of a that was a more. <laughs> Thank you. Putting forward a positive performance. Um, and being confident, and I think having a set list is part of being confident. You know what's happening. You know a structure of of the gig. You're not going to finish a song and then have silence um, mm. in between songs while you figure out which which songs you remember, which next song to play. Having something written out uh, so that you can follow it through. Yeah, and it's not just the order of the the songs and the order of songs as well. I mean, there's a whole lot of other things you can write on your set list. Um, that can make things easier for you, like uh, what's the first chord? Write that down. Mm. Because I, I completely one of those people that particularly if it's a new band that I'm in, I get on stage the first couple of times, I suffer from like stage memory loss. And particularly if I'm the person starting the song, that's pretty bad. Yeah, you do. And <laughs> 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 I'll turn around to someone and be like, how does this song start? And Kane will be like, dun, 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 dun. oh yeah. Um, so the more <laughs> notes you can make on your set, if you're one of those people, or if you don't know if maybe you're one of those people, the more notes you can make on your set list to help you start the song, the better. So if a particular person, if it starts with the drums, then just put a note beside the song, drums, right? Yeah. So, so everyone knows. And the drummer should be writing, yeah, drums, 4-4, yeah. four, four, with the deco, deco, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, and no matter how rehearsed you are in you know, beforehand, shit will fly out the window when you hit the stage, so. What about saying things between songs? Because I kind of think that, um, I've been in bands that have rehearsed the exact 
like ev- everything, like we have a half hour set or a 20 minute set and you rehearse like literally every word that gets this said song between is songs. About blah, blah, yeah, blah. yeah. Hey everybody, this song is about, yeah. What, what about, because I, I, I kind of agree with that in a certain respect, like if you're going to say something, you should know what you're going to say because if you stand up there and, and the song kind of goes dead and you've, you know, you've put time, as, there's no gap, there's a gap between the songs, you know, you're not just running in. So there's silence. And so whoever's got the mic needs to say something or just start the next song. So what are you going to say? Yeah. It needs to be premeditated. So if 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 you're like just a born band leader and you've always got a off the cuff remark for everyone, then you could probably just that could be your shtick, you know. That's your thing. You just say whatever enters your head and mm. it's probably funny and everyone will think that's a great thing to say. I for a long time thought I was a cool off the cuff person. <laughs> and then after each gig came we'd be like we need to sort out what you're actually going to say <laughs> because I would just say ramblings that no one understood. And I, and I for a time, thought that that was just kind of part of my, uh, my allure. <laughs> but it was just nonsensical bullshit. So have an idea, I guess, about when you're going to talk and, and what you're going to say. Yeah. But don't script it or practice word for word because that just comes off as a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It comes off. Or be off. one of those cool post-rock bands that never say anything. That's kind of what I advocate. I reckon don't say anything. That's what you like. If you just 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 figure out how to run into songs, you know, how to end a song and immediately go into another one or make noise while you're tuning or whatever. But I, I don't think say anything. And unless you're the kind of, and this is like country and you're all sitting around. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, because country is about stories, you know, and so you're all sitting around and you're telling a story or whatever. I'd and, argue all songs are about stories. Yeah, well, maybe. If you've got a lyric, you're telling a story. I suppose. But if, if you're the, in the kind of um, genre or you're the kind of artist that needs to talk between songs and you feel like you want to have that extra level of connection, maybe um, don't just make it up. Maybe on your set list, which you have written because you're astute, um, maybe before, at the end of each song, you've written um, something like, thank you. And that's your cue to say, hey, everybody, thank you for coming out tonight thanks to the sound man thanks to the promoter or thanks to the other bands or whatever you know a little note so you don't just sit there for a minute kind of stuttering and going what do I say yeah it's nothing more awkward uh those cows are just going nuts or talk about the cows you know that's talk a good about the cows in between song banter sometimes it can be funny the in between song banter but a lot of the times um it's, it's just it's you've got to take you got to kind of take a cue from what type of music you're playing. I guess if you're, you're playing something that's pretty serious and like if you're playing Doom or something um, and then you try and make some light banter in between songs. <laughs> I, I don't know. I would probably think that was really funny if I went to that sort of a gig. I'd be like, these guys are really unusual and cool. But normally, you know, it kind of fits the genre whether, you, whether you're bantering or not. Yeah, you don't, you don't uh, go to a death metal gig and the band's, you know, playing some really extreme death metal and then stops and goes, hey, guys, Thank you so much for coming out. How's everyone doing? It's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I get a whoop, whoop? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. No, they, they say, this next song is called Decapitated Corpse. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, well, okay, so you're rehearsed, you're organised, you've got a set list and you've got your stupid things that you say between songs. You better have, you better have some good gear. And it better be working properly. So, so many people. How many times have we shown up to a gig and the other band has rocked up and they've been like, oh, has anyone got a drum kit? Can I borrow your guitar amp, mate? Has anyone got some drumsticks? I left mine in the van and our van got nicked. <laughs> have, you know, can I use your vocal mic? Can we that just kind do of- a little shout out to bands that leave their shit in oh, the van God. overnight and then complain the next day when all this stuff gets stolen. Everybody, <laughs> do not leave anything in your van overnight, just ever, outside, anywhere. Spend half an hour loading it Just in. load it in. Load it all in every single time. It just, okay. Anyway. Yeah, have good gear. I mean, Or yes. have gear. <laughs> we always, we, I, I've, I, we've kind of always acted since we've played together and, I, and I've been the same prior to us meeting is that always kind of like act more professional than I, than my stature deserves. So, yeah, I'd always turn up with my own microphone, which is quite unusual for a singer apparently. 
and your own instrument, obviously, which seems like a given. But yeah. I've shared my keyboard with people and sat off stage cursing because there are uh, because there's a drip in this ceiling <laughs> and it's dripping water on my piano. I remember that. And they remark on it. They're like, oh, there's, p- there's water dripping on this piano that, that's not mine. And then they just continue the set because they think they're being professional. And I'm like, that's my fucking piano. <laughs> there's water dripping on it. Can you just move it like half an inch? That would be super sweet. Thanks. Yeah. Anyway, that's my little... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so either, either, okay, if you haven't got gear and you need to go to a gig, organise beforehand with the other musicians or with a mate or whoever to borrow some gear. And it's cool. Everyone does it. We all share gear. We all, you know, everyone at a gig shares a drum kit. It's a standard thing. Someone brings a drum kit and we all share and you bring your breakables, whatever. Organise it beforehand. Never, ever rock up to a gig and don't come prepared, basically, in, unless, you know, or organise it beforehand. Um, and if you... The gear that you are bringing, make sure that it's, man, make sure your guitar has some decent strings on it. Change your strings every now and then. Make sure you've got more than two drumsticks, you know? Make sure your leads aren't crackling. Make sure your strap works. Make sure your bass amp works, you know. Make sure you warm up beforehand if you're a vocalist. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to get into warm-ups. Okay, let's get into warm-ups. Okay. But okay. no, I just saw the next... Now, let's talk about warming up. Okay. So, get loose. Get... Get uh get prepared. It's there's okay. There's two different there's two different kind of ways to warm up, and one is um, actually warming up. You know, physically warming up your body and getting prepared to play. Mm. But I also think uh, a huge part of getting prepared for a gig is warming up mentally, getting mentally prepared. Yeah. So I guess there's kind of you've got warm up and getting psyched up. Yeah. And I think getting psyched up is essential to do it as a band. So you do that together because you're a band and you feel together before you go mm. on stage and you see, you, you know, whatever you're going to do, roll up, do a high five. <laughs> high five. <laughs> a high 10, why not? Uh, what, Break how loose. many people are high 20? <laughs> um, what are you going to do just to feel like a, a football team or something? And then that, so that you feel psyched and together because you want to play together once you get on the stage. So feeling together before you get there is, is a good thing. But in terms of warm ups, I kind of think that for me, I think that's a separate thing. I almost do that separately. I get into my own headspace, do my vocal warm ups, give my fingers a bit of a stretch or whatever you're going to be using. <laughs> And then you do the psych up with the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have a bit of a routine where I would disappear um, halfway through the you know the band that's playing before us. Halfway through the set, I'd disappear and start playing with my drumsticks and doing some star jumps and getting my body ready for a physical performance. Um, you know, and, and doing my rudiments and, and the, you know, guitarist might pick up a guitar and start doing some scales. You might, I don't know, whatever. Get warm. A vocalist might find somewhere to start doing some vocal warm ups. Um, Usually the bathroom and you freak a few people out that walk in. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, sirens. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then then once you're kind of feeling, okay, a bit loose, you know, then, it, yeah, it's time. I think it's time to to kind of mentally prepare yourself, find your band members, start connecting with them, you know, psyching each other up. Give them a little push or something. Hey, hey. Chest bumps. Chest bumps. <laughs> I was going to say pumps, chest <laughs> pumps. <laughs> so yeah, mentally prepare, get each other psyched up. Um, another thing that uh, that you should consider when you are preparing to prepare. when you're preparing <laughs> preparing to prepare <laughs> when you're preparing to play. Hey, prepare to play. That sounds like a really cool free piano course that you can get yeah. at pianofitnick.com forward slash free. Hey, wow, it's so weird that that came up. That's weird. Teaches you exactly what to expect in becoming a pianist. And <laughs> you know what pianists do? What do they do? They show up on time to gigs. Do they though? I don't know. But this pianist does. This one I'm pointing yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah I do. Yes, well, because I am there. To, when, when you <laughs> organise it. <laughs> to get you on, there on time. I am not a punctual person. Show up to gigs on time. Punctuality is important for many reasons, but in this instance... But in this instance, it's another way to give yourself the best chance of a great gig. 
Being at the venue on time tells other people that not only are you prepared, you are considerate of their time. So we're talking about the sound engineer, you're talking about the promoter, the other bands, all these people, I don't know if I can say it. Basically, they're not going to show up on time ever. You should be the one who does. <laughs> you leave work early and you show up on time and you wait for everyone else to arrive and then you sit there and you go, I am better than you. Yep. That's what happens. That's, that is what happens. And that is what you should do, honestly, because there's nothing worse than waiting for people. Honestly, <laughs> I don't know, maybe is this I, the wrong... Was some, whenever I had a gig, it was, this is my job in London, whenever I had a gig to go to, I'd say to my boss, who it's a music company or music publishers, so you know, there's pretty much a clause in your employment contract saying if you're an active musician, we'll make allowances. So whenever I had a gig on, which was fairly often, I'd say, oh, i got to go to soundcheck, so I need to leave now if I'm going to go across London, get my piano, and then go to the other side of London and get to soundcheck on time. <laughs> and my... <laughs> Yes, thank you. And Moore is agreeing with me. <laughs> My boss uh, would normally say to me, yes, that's fine. So you're going to leave now so that you can sit there and wait for your sound engineer and the rest of the bands to arrive. And I, and I would just say to him, yes. Yes. yes that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yes. Because now you're not the asshole. That's it. If, if everyone shows up on time and you are the guy who is late and everyone has to wait for you to sound check and everyone's sitting there giving you the death stare as you load in slowly and fumble around and then get a sound check off, it's, it's, it's not conducive to good relationships. If you're there on time, you're punctual, you know. And it puts extra stress on you. If you, you, you're feeling that everyone's hating on you for being late, yeah. then you're going to be stressed. And yeah. so your gig's going to be shit. Yeah. And the thing is... What's the thing? I was thinking of a thing before. That kind of professionalism helps you gain a reputation within your local scene as being a professional and being a- able to show up on time. Um, so just do it. You you give yourself plenty of time to get ready. Yeah, you may sit around waiting and being bored and hating on other bands and whatever for being late. You probably get some late. free drinks. But you probably you might get some free drinks. You get more time off work. Uh, <laughs> But I think the worst thing, I mean, they're like, you know, people showing up late normally, the thing is most people are accommodating and and they sort of forgive you and you, they rearrange things and everyone goes, you know, it happens to all of us. And it does happen to all of us. Sometimes your transport's late and, and whatever, that happens. So if you are late, just apologize and be sincere. But if you're doing that regularly, um, it becomes a real drag when other bands are having to have to have a s- shorter sound check because you've shown up late. Oh, it's There's the been worst. times when we've waited for other bands to arrive and the engineer, for whatever reason, has decided that we have to wait for them and we can't just have our san- sound check because we're already there. And then you wait for them to arrive and they have their full sound check and then we would just get a line check. Drives like nuts, eh? unbelievable and instant hatred for that other band that was late. And kind of a little bit of a kind of fuck you to the sound engineer as well. I know he's doing his job, but I'm just like, I don't know. Trying to be fair, you know? Yeah. Let's move on and talk about what about, what are, what about, what are you wearing on stage? Clothing. You may not think about it or you may think about it way too much. Um, assuming you're wearing clothing, uh, what you wear is kind of, is, you know, is your call. Um, but I've probably got a few thoughts on, on clothing. You got some thoughts? Yeah. As a drummer, I intentionally wear clothes that are going to be comfortable to wear and comfortable to play in. Um, like what kind of thing? Like jumpsuits? Like a jumpsuit or like l- loose cotton overalls or like a onesie. Mm-hmm. I've never worn any of those things. Um, usually, I would wear shorts uh, rather than tight jeans, which are my um, usual kind of attire yeah, outside of drums. Mm. Um, because you can always just get changed before you go on stage. You want to feel comfortable on stage. 
you want to make sure your clothing is comfortable and you don't want to be thinking about how constricting it is or how itchy it is or how annoyed you are by your clothes while you're trying to put on a good performance. I think for me, my attitude on the whole thing is that you can wear whatever you want for playing a gig. You can wear something super crazy and constricting or something without much material on it. But like whatever is your thing that you're bringing to this band, you can wear. But here's the rub, right? The rub? Yeah, why not? That, yeah, that's... Herein lies the rub, or whatever that saying is. You have to practice in that. So if you plan on mm, wearing something that yeah. isn't completely comfortable, if you're not going to wear trackies <laughs> or, you know, sweat shorts and, and a T-shirt on stage, if you're going to wear anything more constricting than that or more challenging than that, practice in that outfit that you plan so that you can get used to playing your instrument, particularly if you play an instrument. If you're a singer, it probably doesn't matter. Like, honestly, just wear whatever you want. But I know that singers, <laughs> they have to, you know, you're kind of mindful of your tummy because you have to relax your stomach muscles when you're singing. So, mm. you know, wearing something tight around your stomach can feel a little bit, um, you know, self-conscious. But, you know, just bear that in mind. But for everyone else that's having to move a lot to play their instrument, just Practice wearing it as much as you practice playing the songs. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I can't. I can't. I I go to a lot of hardcore shows and metal shows and stuff, and I can't count the amount of times that I have seen a band come on and the singer comes on and he's wearing a beanie, he's wearing a hoodie with the hoodie up, you know, like, and it's summer and he's in a hot venue and he comes on and says, "All right, guys," and does one song and then. It all comes off. And then two, Worth you know. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> he comes on and is like, oh, look at this hard guy. We're all sweating here in singlets. And, and he comes on in a hoodie and a beanie, for fuck's sake. You know, it's not even winter. Um, Everyone knows beanies are hard. And it's just to show how hard he is. But then immediately he just takes it all off because he's way too hot. And it's ridiculous. Just, yeah, whatever. I mean, do what you it's want. It's like people who wear sunglasses. You on know? stage. On stage. Not right then. We're both wearing sunglasses. But, you know, on stage, you know, it's so impractical. It is. I mean, let's get real. Everything's impractical. You bought you bought a six-ton digital keyboard halfway across <laughs> London to play a gig. That's impractical. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a quote here. I was reading a book about Janis Joplin, and I've got a quote from her. She had uh, a friend in the happy days uh, in, who was a designer, and... Uh, just a, just a mate who, who just made her clothes and she became quite a famous designer as they all sort of became famous. Match made um, in heaven. Yeah. She's just a chick who made clothes. But eventually she said this quote, quote, no matter what it looks like, it has to be at least as comfortable as jeans and a t-shirt. You have to be able to forget it the minute it's on. It has to move and just be able to be forgotten because you can't afford to be self-conscious and do whatever it is you're supposed to do. That's uh, Alice Amburn, who said that, who uh, made loads of clothes for Janis Joplin. And I think I think she's onto something there. Do you think that Lady Gaga is, like, super comfortable in a meat dress? Does she perform in it? Or does she just walk from her limo in it? No, I think you... Do you know what? You just out, uh, like, pop cultured me because I'm pretty sure she didn't perform in the meat dress. But similar... <laughs> constricting outfits. No, I, und- I understand. Stage. I understand because it's spectacle, you know. Yeah, and that's what that's kind of what I'm getting at. Is it depends what your thing is. If you're, if a lot of what you're you're doing is based on your image, then mm. you're going to wear something that's not as comfortable as jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah. But you just got to be used to it. Yeah. And that that's where it comes back to practicing in your outfit. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. What's next? Talk to people. When you get to a gig, don't just rock in and uh, sit in your own corner and, and get drunk and, you know, talk to your, your bandmates and, and sort of play your show and leave. Put on a friendly face. Introduce yourself to the people around you. Go and talk to the sound engineer. Make conversation with the promoter, the bar staff, the other bands. Talk to the people who come see you play. And I've been really, really guilty of this many, many times. Um, and it's detrimental the more people in the room that you're familiar with, the more people there are to give you a smile and pay attention when you're on stage. It's a way to make friends. All these people are in your local scene. 
they're all there for probably the same reasons you are. And you're probably going to see them again. So you might as well try and make friends with them, even if you put yourself out there a little bit. <laughs> this is this dog. You... <laughs> Should we shut her inside? Come on, sweetie. Amor's on, she's, Amor's on the mic now. <laughs> you sit. You just sit on me. Okay. Um, talking to people. Yeah, I mean, I've been super go- guilty of that. And I, I look back at all the bands we played with and if I'd made a bit more effort with all of the members of those bands. I mean, the, the span in terms of context is is huge. And and that's just from a selfish point of view. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. You know, I mean, if you're just going to be selfish, which let's kind of face it, most musicians are to a point. A little bit, yeah. Um, you know, it just, you, you're you making contacts for the future, but and even at, at just a sort of a, a short-term sort of reason to do it is that you're going to have a better gig if you've already talked to everyone and you've been a nice person everything is going to go smoothly the sound engineer you know if there's a he might have an okay sound but if you got along well before in sound check he might spend a bit of extra time trying to get a really sweet reverb going on your voice you know totally. it's just that extra sort of mile and it's and it's also about being a friendly person to deal with it means that the sound engineer maybe next time you come back to that venue for a gig and you meet the same bar staff again which we often played at the same sort of venues mm. over and over mm. you come back and you 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 know say hi again to the bar staff and remember their name and and the and sound engineer and, and each gig corresponding to that is is that much better because you've you're building a relationship with the people you're working with. And it's I mean it's this that old saying it's not what you know it's who you, who you know. So if you, if you uh, get booked by a promoter or by a venue or something and um, you talk to them and you are a normal person and maybe you can even become a little bit friendly with them, get along with them in some way, they're going to book you again and they're going to book you over another band who's looking for a gig that they know nothing about or that didn't talk to them at all. Yeah, it's more about, almost more about personality mm. than it is about strictly the music you play, which kind of sucks, but also it's easy to be friendly. It is, yeah. Just make a tiny bit of effort. Um, I want to finish by talking about uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, never do a podcast on drugs or alcohol, um, but I'm not here to tell you. How to live your life. I can only speak from Hugs experience. Hugs not drugs. Hugs not drugs. Dogs not drugs. Hey. Um, dogs not dogs. Basically, it's a it's a massive problem, and I'm, I'm going to go into this in much, much more excruciating detail in, um, in a further podcast, but people always play better when they're sober, and it's a, it's a huge problem that musicians have that we get drunk, um, you know, because it's the whole atmosphere surrounding... The, the music industry um, and you think that you need to relax and get loose and, and get pissed so you can put on a good performance. And quite often it's given to you as well so it's difficult to say no. Yeah, it's but part and parcel. you have to remember is that it, it does affect your performance, at least your intentional performance. It's okay if you have a member of the band. You know, normally the singer can get away with it being a or, you know, entertainer can be a get away with being a little bit cut because, you know, it just makes them more entertaining. But they're singing definitely um, suffers suffers for yeah. that. And as a musician, I mean, I know that it's like the drink goes straight to my fingers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I definitely, you know, the piano's been drinking, not me, has been a, <laughs> a, a very common refrain. But... The best, the best thing for me, I would say, abstaining completely is is not is not for me because quite often when we do a gig, I would be coming straight from work and I need something to kind of switch me into the mood of of playing and being artistic. So I would normally have one drink, mm. um, but no more than that. And normally, just one drink helps me shift. And yeah. so if that's not the point of the no, well, no, but may, okay, that's fair enough. But maybe one drink is. Is uh, is you know not so bad, 
I mean, one drink for anybody in any situation, you can drive after a drink, you know, one drink. You know, it's not... No one will beg- begrudge you a drink. Yeah, you know, if you need a, if, if you want a drink to relax or, or just to chill out, whatever. Um, I'm talking about, you know, basically the more you drink, the more your playing suffers. And it's it's the same for everybody, no matter what. Oh, you know, your mate says, I'm way better guitarist than I'm drunk. He's not. Um, she's not. They are a way better performer when they're drunk. They prance around the stage and they can show off because they're so much more confident, mm. less inhibition, but they're nowhere near as good a player. Personally, I, my drumming goes very, very steeply downhill the more drinks I have. One drink, even one drink, and I'm not as good as I was when I was sober. So I think, I mean, the common theme of all these points seems to be rehearse, you know. Rehearse to prepare for the gig on your instrument. Rehearse if you're planning, you know, your outfit, if you're planning to wear something different. Rehearse being a showman. And mm. if you notice that you are a great performer when you're drunk and you're not when you're not, then maybe you need to take a look at yourself and and examine uh, what's the confidence that's missing and how can you kind of fake that in a way? Or what are the, what are the things that you normally do when you feel confident and you're drunk performing, uh, how can you kind of remember those things and just do them but sober? You know, <laughs> you yeah. can practice being a showman, you can practice being a performer as much as you practice everything else. And it's all a performance anyway, so there's nothing wrong with faking it. Yeah, and if you're keen on 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 practicing like that, um, get drunk and practice. And then and record yourself while you're doing it. Yeah, get a camera. And then listen back to it when you're sober. That's a real easy way to uh, put you off drinking before a gig um, because you will see how sloppy you are. Um, and just imagine that's how your audience hears you. Um, yeah. At your time when you've got them in that room and you're, you know, they're open to, to listening to you and you step on st- up on stage and you're sloppy. And you can't sing properly and your guitar playing isn't sharp and your drumming's slightly off. And they go, meh, I've seen better. And you've wasted that whole opportunity just because you had a couple too many drinks. And I think if I could take a moment to sum up, if I'm not uh, jumping the gun here. Yeah, sum it. I feel like... All of this comes down, obviously we're saying prepare and rehearse everything, but I think it all comes down to the fact that um, each gig is important. No matter what it is, no matter what other bands are playing, if it's you're playing with some big bands or un, other unknown bands, um, each gig is important. So don't throw away a gig by, be, by drinking. Don't mm. throw away a gig by not preparing or not being on time because each gig there are people there no matter how few or no matter how much, and they are judging you. And it's not just them because they will either recommend you to their friends or they'll slag you off. (laughs) Yeah, and next time you come to town, they'll go, hey, we should go see that band because they are really good and last time I saw them, they're amazing. Or they'll say, no, let's not bother. Let's go to the other gig because last time I saw them, um, they were rubbish or they were drunk or they were... Sloppy or, I don't know. Had this dog that just kept like... Dog sitting on their lap. Croaking the entire time. weird. Oh, that seems seems like it's enough. Um, What about... um, I mean, something's been going on with you for the last week. Where can... These people are going to hear this on Monday morning for the Southern Hemisphere, Sunday night for the kind of Northern-ish Hemisphere, America Mm -hmm. and stuff. What are they gonna what are they gonna find in your world? Well, if they go to my world, my world is is wrapped up in a, a little thing called pianopitnic.com. Picnic.com. I can't say it properly because of my New Zealand accent. We don't say picnic a whole lot, so it was a <laughs> We a, don't a rough choice of a of a company. We say name. barbecue. Piano picnic means uh, you know, that's supposed to mean that learning piano is easy and it's fun and it totally is and I, I have a huge passion for piano and that's why I, I teach it via online courses and if you had this on Monday you will have just missed out <laughs> I don't know if there's a point in saying but this week I launched my my premier course Songs by Air 
which teaches, as I said before, teaches people to play piano just by listening, learn a song that you love just from listening to it, not from using sheet music or YouTube tutorials or any of those other annoying things. Um, And, yeah, enrollment actually closed on uh, Saturday night, midnight. Sucker, you missed out. Eastern time. Sucker, you played yourself. Um, But... It will be opening again soon. So what you can do is go to pianoputin.com, click on the songs by ear thing in the navigation and uh, sign up to the updates because if you are interested in that kind of shiz, then uh, you'll be notified when my enrollment next opens. And hey, if you're, uh, you know, piano curious um, and maybe you're not um, ready, ready to commit to a, you know, full-fledged um, big boy course... I like songs by ear. Uh, Piano Picnic offers other courses. There's a there's a free course um, for those of you you know who might might be just sort of thinking about piano. Those of you who are kind of like yeah, pianos. I dig piano. I'd I'd be piano into into dope. playing keyboards and some cool stuff. Um, there's a there's a course for you called Super Basics, and it's cheap and it's quick, and you can do it whenever you want. Um, we call it a mini course. Yeah, mini course. Um, and it, and it will basically it's the Super Basics of piano, and it will get you playing piano and impressing your friends. Um, and it's good for you producers out there. I think piano is an essential skill uh, when you're producing music, making music on computers, using MIDI keyboards and stuff like that. I agree. Learn a bit of piano, learn some chords, learn some scales, learn to figure out what your notes are. You'll be better off for it. Um, and once you've checked out all the piano stuff, make sure uh, to go to the Musician's Map site um, and check out everything that's happening there. Um Get the free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard, if you're making music. Um, if you're not making music, uh, you can get my ebook, um, the Musician's Map ebook, and it's also an audiobook. And even if you are making music, even if you're trying to figure out how to make money for music, uh, you can download that ebook. Uh, and there's so much information in there. Um, it's a tome. What um, kind of thing does it tell us? Well, it tells you everything from listening and learning an instrument. Um, right through to gigging, um, things like we talked about tonight, um, right through to recording, making money as a musician, being becoming a performer, touring. It's really got it all. Um, it's a lot of my experience-based advice, and um, it's it's worth uh, so much more than I'm charging for it. So, And having it read it myself, I have to say... Um, you do, you know, there are a lot of music industry type advice books out there. Um, but the difference with this one is that it's written from a genuine place from Kane where, whereby he, he just wants to give people the sort of hardened uh, knowledge that he has won over the course of a few decades of playing in bands so this is not you know some high up producer trying to make extra coin this is I mean you're a great producer <laughs> Barely. but it's it's truthful advice and it's honest and there's no glossing over things just to make make things sound nice and fluffy and no it, it's it's very much the sort of information you would get if you talk to a good friend who was a learned, experienced musician. And that's what it's all about. Sharing knowledge and advice about music um, and everything that I've got, I want to give um, for you guys so that you can have a better experience and so that we can all be this community who loves music and who loves making music. So please check out Piano Picnic. Um, go and check out the Musician's Map site. There's loads of free stuff there if you don't feel like buying anything. Um, Otherwise, everybody, get in touch. Um, I really love hearing from you, so send me an email, kane at musiciansmap.org, or get in touch via the Facebook group. Um, It's just Facebook, something, Musician's Map group. I don't know, you'll find it. Search Musician's Map. Um, (laughs) Come on. Yeah, there'll probably be a link. There'll be a link in the podcast (laughs) description. Don't be so lazy. Um, (laughs) The artist of the week this week is St. Vincent. Um, she's already massive and she's got a huge following, but suck it. Go listen to her album. Um, it's called... Mass Seduction. Mass Seduction. It's incredible. We've been cranking it. Um, yeah, go and check it out. She's real cool and this is her best record. And then I 
love with Dance Me On. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, yep. Stay positive. <laughs>